Gurmeet. Ah, uh, you're here. So, is there anything you guys want to talk about? Josh? Um, I've been, I've gone through the videos a couple of times and uh, I haven't started taking notes. So I'm not exactly sure how to take notes. I feel like writing down what's said isn't, it's, it's, in, it's meant to be interpreted, but I also don't feel like I know enough to interpret it accurately. So I'm wondering if you have any suggestions. So you approach everything within the context of where you are in your own life. And so let's just say that, forgive me, let's just say that you're going through a divorce or through some breakup. Maybe you lost your job. Or maybe you've gone to the doctor for a routine checkup and he or she looks at you and says, you got cancer, whatever the case may be. So there's a sense of loss, and it's quite painful because it goes against all the things that you expected for yourself and your life. And so you got to kind of figure out what do you want to do with this new information that maybe you failed a class or you won't graduate, or your boyfriend doesn't love you, or your wife is leaving you, or your kid is sick and probably won't survive. And with such an emotional tsunami that lives inside you, you say, okay, I've been a devout Christian for most of my life. Is there a book in the Old or the New Testament I can kind of find refuge in? And you read the book of Job. And the book of Job is interesting for a variety of reasons. It's probably the oldest book in the Old Testament. And it's not original. It comes from the ancient Samaria. But all of the side, you realize that Job was a man very much like you. You know, he paid his taxes, went to the church or the synagogue, worshipped his gods, was good to his family, his wife, his kids, his neighbors. And all of a sudden, all these bad things happened to him. You know, his kids are butchered in front of him. His cows and animals are all dead. His land, all of a sudden, everything dies and decays. And ultimately, he himself gets sick, and he doesn't know why. And to understand the book of Job, you need to understand Deuteronomy and Leviticus. These are called the wisdom tradition. And it means the following, that, you know, you come to class every day, you take notes, you raise your hand, you ask questions, you do all the assignments, and you take notes. And the assumption you have that lives behind all of these activities is that if I do as I'm required, I will probably get an A or a B in this class. And that's what Job did. He followed all the signposts. You know, he followed your GPS to life. And in the end, he realized that he's not getting what he expected. God was supposed to be good to him. Life was supposed to be good to him. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. Good things don't happen to bad people, and bad things don't happen to good people. And uh, so that's the book you read, because it seems as if your life is very much like Job. You did all the right things, and all of a sudden, you know, things are happening to you that you have no control over anymore. And as you read the book of Job, you realize that you can read your own story, you can read your own pain, in his writing, in his language, uh, your grief and his grief have very many things in common. And you demand justice, you know, you go to the doctor and you say, I want a second opinion and a third opinion or a fourth opinion. And your wife says, okay, Josh, calm down, it's okay. Very much like the friends of Job's, you know, um, Alafaz, uh, Bildad and Zophar, they go to him and they say the same thing. That this is happening to you probably because of A, B, C, D. And Job says, no, I don't deserve this. And so people try to convince you that it's okay, you know, things will pass. 
دور گردون گرد و روزی بر مراد ما نرفت دائما یکسان نماند دور گردون غم مخور that even though that the wheel of life did not go according to our plans don't worry eventually something will happen and our desires will be fulfilled life is not just one direction it's not all negative there are moments that positive stuff will enter into your life and you'll be happy and so there's a good chance that as you read the book of job you're going to miss the first maybe i don't know 10 15 pages and you're going to miss the 10 15 pages because god keeps saying that i like job i like job very much and job says oh i'm a great guy you know, I'm righteous, and God says, yes, he's righteous. And Job says, I like myself, and God says, yes, I like him as well. So you're not going to look at things that don't relate to you. And you keep flipping through the pages very, very quickly because you feel that they are irrelevant to your life, to where you are. And all of a sudden, his kids die. And Job says, I am so sad. And the word sad pushes a button inside you. Why? Because you're sad. You know, for the past 20 pages, it's all about happy. Now you're sad. And that's something you can relate to. And now you begin to have focus. Now you pay attention and you take notes. Because these are the stuff that you're interested in. This is the stage where you are. These are the feelings that you also share with Joe, who lived some three, four, five, ten thousand 10,000 years ago. And then you take notes on when his friends come. You take notes on when he raises his fist to the heavens and says, if I have sinned, show me. Tell me what I've done wrong in life to be deserving of this. Now you're going to miss the part where Job accepts his fate. You're going to miss the part where Job says, God gives and God take it away. I'm going to receive both with calm and acceptance. You're going to miss all those parts because you're not there yet. And so in reading anything, in watching a movie, in thinking thoughts, the truth is we're always going to be limited because we can only relate to things that we ourselves are triggered. If, for example, 20 hands go up and you ask me a question, the truth is I'm not going to entertain all questions. I don't care about your curiosity. I have to relate to the question. Okay, I'm, not, I'm going to dismiss your intentions. I'm going to dismiss your passion. I'm going to dismiss your interest. I'm going to dismiss all of it. Why? Because I'm not interested. And I can't talk about things I'm not interested in. My brain doesn't work that way. I can't take notes on things that I'm not interested in. And you're going to do the same thing. And there is nothing wrong with it. You don't have to be interested in everything that's out there. Just know what you're interested in, what moves you, inspires you, and take notes on those things. And as you move to a different stage, you know, initially what happens in all relationships, you're interested in the moments of happiness and joy because you're governed by certain fantasies. And then you realize, well, life is not a very smooth sailing. So you begin to focus on the problematic events of life. Okay. The joy goes away, now you take notes on the problems. And then you say, okay, is there a way to resolve them? Now you read books okay, that are basically focused on how do you resolve problems. Okay. Then when you're done with all of that, you get to be like 60 or 70 or 80. Now you're focused on acceptance. This is what life is. you know. <laughs> so... Uh, if you look at the way the questions have been formulated, good morning, is, you know, just figure out what captures your attention and just focus on that and write on that. You know, I can't, no one can uh, push you into becoming interested in something that you're not. It's, uh, and forgive me for going this way, Malcolm X in his biography and in, in his very many talks that he did uh, near the end of his life, he had this beautiful analogy, and again, forgive me for using it in this particular way. He has, he's talking about two black men, but he puts them within this particular category. One is, one he calls the field Negro, and the other he calls the house Negro. The house, 
the house is a very interesting character. And it's not that everybody all of a sudden enters into becoming a house. Eventually, they begin as a field. And the field is you're staying home, you're having a good time with your wife, your kids. Life is really, really good. Someone like me enters your life, and I have a great amount of power. And I don't care if you like me or not. I'm going to use a good amount of force to drag you out of your life, regardless of how physically impoverished it may be. And I'm going to push you in all sorts of ways so that you can come to accept my philosophy of life. Okay? Now, for those of you who are interested in Abraham Maslow, one of the things that he experienced when he went to Lightfoot Indians in Canada is that the questions that he asked in America as his, he was doing research, those questions don't really apply to the Native Americans. They don't really know what dominance is. They're rarely aggressive. You know, you don't talk about sexual preferences in those environments. So what he did after doing five, 10 years of research, he had to trash all of them, okay? Because the definition of being rich, the definition of being mature, they were very, very different than the white culture. And so <clears throat> I drag you out of your house, I bring you into my mansion, and I look at you, and I'm going to intuit. I'm going to say, okay, do I like him? Do I not like him? Is he passive? Is he aggressive? Now, the more passive you are, I'm going to invite you to my house. But you can't go anywhere. I'm going to put you in the kitchen. And then I'm going to give you things that you've never had before. I'm going to give you an eclair. And I'm going to give you an oven. And I'm going to give you a stove. And I'm going to give you soap and water and towels. Not only can you wash yourself, not only can you help your wife washing herself and the kids, but you also live under this roof, it's beautiful. And I'll give you a little nook, back of the house, for you and your wife and your kids to live. And after a while you say, my God, I never had these things, this is beautiful. And what I'm doing is I'm helping you forget your past. I will help you, manipulate you, exploit you, in you forgetting your history. You will care for me more than you will your wife. You will care for me more than your own kids. Should anything bad happen to me, and should the same, say, illness falls on your wife, the first person you take care of is me. You are far more intimate to me than you are to your wife at this stage. Okay. Now, you're going to turn your back to your own people who look like you, talk like you, smell like you, okay? Your status has gone up. Now, there are this other group of people. Uh, there is this other group of people that he calls the field Negroes. For whatever the reasons are, I, the owner of this property, I look at them, I don't like them. I see them as, I am mule. I want them to work. It's kind of like what the Arabs did to us Persians many, many thousands of years ago. That you come to my house, you invade my country, you break down my door, and you take my horse, and you claim my horse, and you ride the horse as I have to walk. And every time I see you on my horse and my country, I have to bow and pay you respect. Now, what happens is that those who work in the field Never forget who they are. Never forget what they are. Never forget their history. And any chance they get to get out, they will get out. Okay. <clears throat> and I suppose the nice thing about assimilation, the nice thing about being conditioned, uh, by society that has such a huge force is that the function of life really is just quite simple. For you to forget who you are. And you only take notes on, and you only pay attention and you have interest on things that will continue to help you to forget. The moment you remember, 
Everything about your life will crash. Yeah. It's Malcolm X. Uh, the philosophy of being rebellious, which is philosophy itself. Before we entertain more questions, let me tell you a story and then we'll go home. And it's a story that some of you in this class have heard before, uh, many of you haven't. It's about the life of a tiny little salmon fish. You know, salmon begins her life as a tiny little egg under some tiny little rocks. And they're usually on top of this pool of water. And as the force of the water is going downhill, at a certain point, uh, the egg kind of gets released from the prison of the rocks and slowly floats downwards. By the time it it's the pool of water, it's a living, quacking fish. Swims around, has a good time. And as the fish is swimming in the, you know, the ocean, the sea, the water, whatever the case may be, you know, you begin to have friends. You get married, you have children, you buy a house, you have a bank account, you create a town named Oakland, and you have lots of friends. At a certain point in the salmon's fish psychology, and I don't know why it happens or how it happens, but at a certain point, the salmon says, I don't like where I am. What do you mean you don't like where you are? I don't like where I am. And the salmon, you know, like any 18 year old goes to the parents and says, why am I here? And the parents said, well, that's a ridiculous question. You're here. Why were you, why was I born? I don't know, you're just here. And the salmon begins to ask all these questions. And the parents think that the salmon has gone mad. They give him, you know, some therapy, some drugs perhaps, alcohol, porn, whatever the case may be. But the questions don't go away. And as the salmon just lives, you know, her life day after day, the questions become more intense. There comes a point where the salmon asks questions, but no one can answer those questions. And the salmon gets really, really sad. And at a certain stage, the salmon stops thinking, stops asking. He says, you know what? I've done a lot of thinking. I've done a lot of asking. People are useless. My own people are useless. And I'm going to just close my eyes. If you watched uh, Star Wars, Trust the Force, Luke, you know, get rid of the scanner. Just close your eyes and trust the Force. And... The salmon says, you know what? I think I'm just going to trust the force or the life that lives inside me. I'm going to allow it to be my GPS. And the salmon turns around and just follows her own intuition. And during this usually happens during springtime. The bears are out of hibernation. They're hungry. So the bears are standing um, at this pathway. And the salmon has to do something very interesting. The salmon now begins to fly. And they're journeying towards this place that were, they were once simply an egg. How this happens, no one knows. And as the salmon goes back home, and he doesn't know, she doesn't know where home is, all he knows is that the life he has made for himself or herself is no longer a home. It's a house, just not a home and swims back and follows his or her intuition. Uh, for those of you in this class who have read the Gospel of Luke, it's a very, very interesting passage where after he has trained his disciples to the best of his abilities and to the best of his disciples' capacity, he says, you've received freely, now go out there and give freely. Should anyone ask you a question, don't think. You are not the speaker, but the Father within you your intuition, but you have to be profoundly mature. You have to be trained well for a long, long time for this intuition to come to life and speak through you. And so whenever anyone asks you a question, it's the father within you that answers, it's not you. And that's what the salmon fish does. 
it allows the force that lives inside him to govern him or her. Eventually, out of perhaps the thousands of salmon that are flying towards home, wherever that may be, about 80% are devoured by the bears. About 5, 10, 15, 20 find their destination. They hatch their eggs and they die. And so the sort of philosophy that we'll be talking about in this class is very much the same. That you have someone like Karl Marx, okay? Marx is a guy who says, you know what? Capitalism is great. There's nothing wrong with capitalism because it does make life easy. But if you look at all the clutter that lives in your house, what are you doing? Like the salmon fish, you keep accumulating, accumulating. And once in a while, you realize you become a house person, you know, that you're in the grips or imprisoned or enslaved by all the desires created by capitalism. Once in a while, this voice comes out and says, why do you need all this stuff? Why are you going to school? Ridiculous classes. Drop the class. Be free. And very much like a salmon fish, you say, I don't know where home is, but I just know that this is not the place I belong to. Okay. And it can be very daunting, very terrifying, because all of us in this classroom, we have built a life for ourselves, not just a physical life. You have a belief system. You have a history. You have a certain set of emotions that give you value, give you identity, give you meaning, give you purpose. I mean, look, all of you are here for one reason, because you value the system that says when you graduate, your status will go up. You have upward mobility. Society determines how much your value and worth are. If you go to Laney, you're worth five bucks. If you go to East Bay, you're worth 25 bucks. If you go to San Francisco, you're worth 50 bucks. If you go to Stanford, you're worth a million. And so all of a sudden, everybody strives to go to Stanford. Okay. At a certain point, like the salmon, you say, okay, you know, so I get this degree, but I feel as if something about my software is just wrong and I don't know what it is. Now, for you to listen to the voice of conscience, you have to look at your degree from all these ridiculous places and say, oh my God, I spent five years getting a PhD. It means nothing. I spent 20 years building a life. That means nothing. I have all this information in my head and they mean nothing. And so despite the fact that all of us desire truth and sincerity and honesty and passion, the truth is the price that we have to pay, it's just way, way, way too much. Uh, Nietzsche has this beautiful saying that we put Jesus on the cross, not because he was honest, not because he was a prophet, not because he had wisdom. Jesus just made the rest of us feel bad and look bad, you know? And how do you get rid of the feeling of badness about yourself? Well, just break the mirror. When you don't look yourself in the mirror, you don't see gray. You don't see exhaustion on your face. You're always walking around saying, oh, yes, I'm 20. And so when you get rid of Jesus, you can go back believing yourself that you're a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim. Get rid of Socrates and you believe that you're a philosopher. And that's what we have a tendency of doing. Anyone else before we? Naomi? I'm just no one? Andrew? Understanding versus knowing. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was, I think, either a 16th or a 17th century romantic philosopher, sociologist. He was just, you know, a human being who had a capacity to observe what's around. And he wrote this beautiful book called Emil. It's about the education of young children. And out of that come people like Rudolf Steiner, uh, who gave birth to the Waldorf schools. That modern education or society 
the only reason it educates people is to create workers, to create mules, you know. <clears throat> Rousseau, if I'm not mistaken, despite having read, I mean, having written all these wonderful books about education, how to be a good parent and all that, I think he had nine kids, if I'm not mistaken. He didn't raise any single one of his children. They all went to foster care. Maybe he believed that raising kids is a waste of his time. His time would be better served by him thinking and writing. He understood society. Now, and what it does to people. All of us in this class have moments where you get into a relationship with anything, really, and you say it stinks. Amen. And it can be your relationship to this class. It matters very little. There is a knowing that is based, revolves around your feeling. I come to this class and something about me says it stinks, it sucks, I hate this guy. Okay. Now that's a knowing that goes to your feeling, but there are no reflections to it. You feel it and you know what you feel. Now there comes a point where you want to know something, but you don't want this knowing to be revolving around your feelings. You want to understand it. The thing with understanding is you have to detach yourself from your emotions. And that's something that people usually go through if they're really good and if they're in capacity at the right place in their life, if they're a good therapist. That's what the therapist does. I hate so-and-so. And you have a good amount of anger being built up over the past maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And you go to your therapist and... You know, you kind of say, no, no one can help me. I know you can't help me either. And he, of course, he or she proves you wrong. Little by little, every time you speak with your emotions, he or she stops and says, well, why do you feel this way? And the problem with why do you feel this way is you can't talk through your emotions. He or she demands that you kind of walk outside of yourself, look at the emotion, put it within the context of history, Okay. All the causes and effects. And he wants to or she wants to know if you can see all the components. Now, a couple of things will happen. First, you have to go back and figure out if you can actually see those components. Then, if you've seen Soprano, um, you know, in five or six or eight series, it's, I think, the first episode of the show where uh, he goes to see a therapist. Okay, And every time he gets upset because the th therapist pushes a button, he uses all these profanities, he gets up and just leaves. There comes a point where he has built trust and he opens up. And he is able to, she is able to help him. And he has gone to the, he's reached that capacity where she can kind of speak to him very honestly. Well, do you treat your wife because of the way your mother was towards you? And he's Italian. Well, we don't speak about our parents in a negative way. We love them, even if they're crapped on us on a daily basis. Okay. And little by little, he understands. But here's the thing. Just because you understand, it doesn't mean you can change anything. To change what you know and what you understand requires a different set of knowing and understanding. Now, look, you may know that your relationship is toxic. You may understand why it is toxic. Once in a while, you have these glimpses like the salmon fish. I need to get out. Well, you need a different set of tools. You need to know what's going to happen when you leave. Do you know how your wife will cope? Do you know how your kids will cope? Do you know how you will cope? Because it's not just your wife and kids you have to answer to. You have to answer to your parents. You have to answer to God. You have to answer to the bigger aspect of society. Do you know how you will be? Next is, well, what are you going to do when you're lonely? OK. 
Okay. So a lot of us in this class know a good amount of things with little understanding, intellectual understanding. It's going to take you a long time to say, I'm tired of being an emotional junkie. I want to understand intellectually why this is happening. Then you understand why it's happening. Then you say, okay, I want to get out. And if you've seen the Farrah Fawcett movie, I think it's called The Burning Bed, in the 1980s, she falls in love, gets, and this guy keeps pushing for sex, and she says, no, marriage first, then sex. They get married, they have sex, they have beautiful kids. One day she goes and asks, it's a, based on a true story, by the way. She goes and asks him a question, and he slaps her really hard in front of a crowd. And the abuse continues, and continues, and continues. And she leaves, he begs, she goes back. He abuses more, she leaves, he begs, she goes back. There comes a point where she knows this is bad, she understands this is bad, but every time he begs, emotionally she softens, she goes back. There comes a point where she sees her kids, she sees her black and blue face, and now they live in an apartment. When he's drunk and he's passed out, he takes the kids out of the window, says, you guys go down. He puts lighter fluid everywhere, puts the house to flames. He dies. She's arrested, taken to court, and she tells the jury and the judge her story. Free to go. Now, it took, um, if I'm not mistaken, the real life person in the story about, I think, eight years to finally leave. Because remember, we're all addicted to our lifestyle. We're all addicted to our belief systems. We are addicted to our station in life. And you may not like it, but just because you don't like it, it doesn't mean you can walk away. You need, again, a different set of tools to be able to apply what you know. If I was to go back to all the things I've said in the past two, three, four, five months, or maybe 30 years of my life, it'd be the following. Let me begin with this story. I, uh, Abhi, good morning. How are you? Good, thank you. I had a friend, uh, she was the sister of my, one of my good friends, Saeed. Saeed was a uh, political prisoner <clears throat> and um, there was a date to his execution, but thankfully something happened and he was let go. His sister, at a certain point, desired to learn how to play the sitar. Uh, it's a Persian uh, instrument, it's very small. Um, the Indian sitar is far more complicated, so we won't even go there. In San Jose, she worked with a teacher. Um, I think his name was Mahmoud Zolfunun or Zolnun. There came a point where she had to go to Washington to live. In Washington lived the most famous of sitar and tar players in Iran at that time. His name was Muhammad Reza Lutfi. She had worked with this teacher in San Jose for about two years. When she goes to Washington to meet this guy and she had a letter from his, her teacher, the first thing that the new teacher asks is, let me play, play, let me see your form. And after 10 minutes, she looks at it and says, everything about your form is wrong, everything. For two years, this great teacher has told you how to place your hand here, how to move your finger, how to hold the sitar, but everything is wrong. It took her about six months to overcome the addiction. And that's the point, that you have been left to your own devices for the past, say, 30, 40, 50 years, to feel the way you want to, to understand your own emotions, to act on the emotions, act on the little intellectual understanding that you have. And then you come at a point where you say, yeah, you know, my life is not working for me. Is there a way I can change? Well, yes. Someone needs to walk into your life and put everything you've stored, accumulated over the past many years, they gotta destroy it. 
And once you're a blank slate, now you can be written upon. A teacher, for the most part, really is like an eraser. They erase everything you've written, and they begin to write on you. 